Okay, so next we're going to hear from the toxicologist on potential exposure routes and proposed cleanup levels. What it means, uh, PC oh, and toxicology. For, 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 oh, for, for her. her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> of course, everyone now knows what PC is and routes, so we're, we're ready to hear, get some more information um, on the specifics. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Regina Linville. I'm a toxicologist at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Um, we call it a WEHA. And I'm here tonight to talk about potential risks and impacts of PCE and breakdown products. So a WEHA is the lead state entity um, to evaluate human health impacts uh, due to chemicals in the environment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. Our expertise is in toxicology and risk assessment of chemicals. And when we're called in, it's usually to give a neutral and objective review of the science that uh, informs us about human health effects. Next slide, please. So in human health risk assessment, um, risk is a combination of toxicity and exposure. You have to have a toxic chemical present to have risk, and you have to have exposure to a person to have risk. Um, in human health risk assessment, we, fo we focus on the questions, are toxic chemicals present? Where and how much? Are people exposed to toxic levels of the chemicals? And what are the potential health impacts due to the exposure related with the contaminated site? So tonight we're here to talk about contamination at the Marinwood Plaza Shopping Center, which you all know much more about than I do. Um, I do know that a previous dry cleaning operation released chlorinated solvents here. The solvent was tetrachloroethylene, which we'll call PCE. And we're concerned about that chemical and what we call the daughter products, which are really just the natural breakdown products uh, from that chemical. And we're interested in that chemical in soil, in soil vapor, in groundwater, and in indoor air. Next slide, please. So the question is, the first question is, are the chemicals toxic? And that's, um, the clear answer to that is yes, these are toxic chemicals. Um, uh, PCE and its breakdown products, which are shown here. And we're focused on the chronic human health impacts from ongoing exposures to these chemicals. We know that PCE can cause cancer in laboratory animals, and there is suggestive evidence that it can cause cancer in people. We know that two of the breakdown products, TCE and vinyl chloride, which is shown as VC up there, um, we know that those chemicals cause cancer in humans and in lab animals. And all of these chemicals can cause non-cancer hazardous effects. Such as? What are the hazardous effects? Such as? What would the non-cancer effects? Well, the non-cancer effects, I'm going to go into that on the next slide. So this site mainly has, next slide, sorry. Thank you. This slide mainly has PCE, so I'm going to focus on PCE tox toxicity. And first I'll talk about cancer. Long-term exposure to PCE um, may increase the risk of cancer. Uh, high doses of PCE in laboratory rodents causes increased tumors in liver. And there is limited evidence that there may be an increased risk of cancer in people. 
And that comes from some studies I have tracked of uh, workers in the dry cleaning industry. And from those studies, the conclusion is that there may be an increase in certain types of cancer in these people. The cancer is bladder cancer, blood system cancer, and lymphatic system cancer. But the evidence is not very strong for this. There's a lot of other things that could be causing this increase in cancer rates in these people. And these studies are unclear as to um, often the separation between people working in the dry cleaning industry and people working in the non-dry cleaning laundry industry. So there are a lot of unknowns with that. Um, <coughs> Non-cancer effects occur at higher doses. So the effects that we see in laboratory animals are in liver, uh, liver damage, and the effects that we see in people are at much higher doses and they're usually central nervous system effects. So we don't focus a lot on these non-cancer effects because by the time you get that level of exposure, you have a pretty significant cancer risk exposure. So when we clean up, when risk managers address contamination at the site for PCE, it's usually controlled by addressing cancer risk. So I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to explain how we estimate cancer risk for different dose levels of a carcinogen. Thank you. Um, this graph shows the relationship between an increased dose of chemical and increasing risk of a tumor. Now these three data points demonstrate a really important principle in toxicology, which is when we see a toxic chemical with a dose increasing, we see increasing observed effects. So many of our carcinogens that we assess the risk of, we have to depend on laboratory data and in lab rodents, and that is the case for PCE. So next slide, please. Um, in cancer bioassays, lab animals are exposed to increasing doses of a chemical for most of their lifetime. And then they are assessed after the experiment for whether or not they develop to, uh, tumors. So this graph shows three increasing doses with increasing occurrences of tumors. And next slide, please. We then take the relationship between those doses and the response that we call the dose-response relationship. We extrapolate that down to a very low dose that is associated with an extremely low probability of developing cancer. And that's how we determine a human dose. Um, and the human dose is what the screening levels are based on. The human dose is a safe dose, but I have to tell you toxicologists never ever want to say safe about anything. So really a human dose is, um, is a dose that we don't expect to cause harm. But really with this, it, it is associated with an extremely low probability of cancer. Next slide, please. Okay, so say we have this data. In this example, the lowest dose gave um, uh, cancer to 20% of the, of the mice. Uh, next slide, please. What we do next is we extrapolate down using that dose-response relationship, and we, to a level that would, um, instead of a 20% probability of cancer, would give a 0.0001% probability of cancer. And that is where we get that dose. And it's important to understand that in this system, the system of cancer risk assessment, there is never a zero probability of cancer unless you have absolutely no dose. So we consider any exposure to a carcinogen to have a risk and we quantify that no matter how low that risk is. Next slide, please. So what does this cancer risk mean? First, I want to clarify a couple terms. Sometimes when you hear about these sites and risk assessments, you hear terms like one in a million cancer risk, 10 to the negative six cancer risk, and things like that. So I wanna tell you that that percentage I just showed you, 0.0001% probability of developing cancer is the same as a one in a million chance of probability of causing cancer, and the same of what we call 10 to the minus six. It's the same probability that we talk about in different ways. 
the cancer risk that we're discussing, that we, that we discuss in human health risk assessment, is the increase in probability of contracting cancer over a lifetime due to a specific exposure source. This is called the incremental lifetime cancer risk, and it's abbreviated as ILCR. So an important thing to understand about this is that um, we don't have yes and no answers on cancer. We are working, there's no guarantee that an exposure will or will not lead to a cancer. What we do is we work with a probability continuum, <laughs> and it's much in the way that I just explained. Um, and the probability increases with increasing dose. So the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, considers that one in a million probability of, of getting cancer to be a slight risk and a one in 100,000 probability, which we also call 10 to the minus five, um, as, a, as a very low risk. And US EPA and pretty much most of the toxicological authoritative bodies in the world agree with this. Um, in the United States, the typical person has a lifetime cancer risk of 35%. It's a 35% probability of developing cancer in your lifetime. So when we look at that and we add the one in a million probability that you might get from site, and this could be one in 100,000 or one in 10,000, you see that it's a fraction, a very low fraction of a percent. This is not to say that it's not important, these low exposures. And, um, but we have to be able to talk about it. We have to have a way to talk about these cancer risks and to um, really in risk assessment, it's a tool that's talking about probability so that we can compare risks, the magnitude of risks. For, an, for example, if we had a site that had one in 10,000 probability of developing cancer due to the exposure to that site, that's a probability of 0.01%. We would take that much more seriously than if we had a contaminated site that had the one in a million probability of developing cancer. That's how we use these probabilities. That's really their, their design. They're for um, risk managers to be able to understand risk. So how much PCE is at this site and where is it? PCE is found at concentrations above our screening levels both on and off the site. And it's important to understand what we mean when we say our screening levels. Uh, the Regional Water Board uses um, environmental screening levels, ESLs, and, what those, and they're similar to what's used in other areas as well as far as the process. Um, these are chemical concentrations in environmental media that are expected to present a negligible risk for a specific human exposure. So this is important. The, in this case, all but one of these ESLs are calculated to protect people from the inhalation of PCE in indoor air. That's what the soil is based on. That's what the soil vapor is based on. And, um, and one of the groundwater um, screening levels. So it's important not to think that this is, that we're talking about touching the soil or something like that. These soil, these um, environmental screening levels are designed to look at how much chemical is in a soil that moves into the soil gas and then moves into your house and, is, and then that you breathe in. So um, that's where these, these, that's the way these ESLs are developed. There is one ESL that is based on drinking water. If you look on the last, on the bottom row, in the last column, we have groundwater ESLs. We have one that's five, which was mentioned before, and that is the MCL for drinking water. Um, and we have the 63 micrograms per liter, which is the ESL for whether or not there's enough volatile chemical in that water to transform vaporize into vapor, go up into soil, and go up into the house. Uh, next slide, please. So what are our exposure routes at this site? We have two exposure, possible exposure routes, inhalation 
That could be indoor air or outdoor air and ingestion, um, and that would be drinking water. So um, there's the, the groundwater on, under, and around the site is not used for drinking water, um, but there is a potential drinking water source on the adjacent or nearby ranch. Next slide, please. So now we know that toxic chemicals are present and that the exposure levels, that the exposure routes exist. So are people actually exposed to toxic levels of PCE? Well, the data shows exposure to one group, on-site workers in the liquor store. Um, they are breathing indoor air that is a little bit higher than our ESL. It's still very low risk, but it is higher than our ESL. And we would expect for that to change after the remediation. Um, residents are not being exposed to PCE in indoor air based on the failure to find volatile organic chemicals in the soil gas throughout the neighborhood. exposure, you sample around it and see if it's moving. And since they have samples throughout the neighborhood, it, um, and none of them have any detect of all the organic chemicals, it, it really looks like that chemical is not moving. Into the I, I mentioned before that I don't think that they were taking the samples in the right places as mentioned before. And I think that it's too risky to say that it's not in the fact, in not just every seven, I think that it's too risky that it's taken in the government spectrum. Uh huh, yes, yes, I understand that. In fact, we hear that a lot. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, <coughs> outdoor air is uh, has been measured, and, and there are low levels. They're pretty much background levels for California, and they are not at toxic levels. And the drinking water well on the nearby ranch had very low levels of PC in the well. It has higher levels in the groundwater aquifer, in the well low levels, and it received treatment. So from my perspective, when we look at human health, we look at that toxic chemicals present, exposure to people. We don't have that connection there. And, um, and that's why we don't consider risk. So what are the potential health impacts? Considering the lack of exposure, the potential impacts are few for the current scenario based on the data that we have. Um, commercial worker risk from inhalation of PCE and in indoor air is very low. The excess probability is about 0.0003%. Uh, um, and again, we didn't find any VOCs in the residents and the drinking well has treatment. But we also want to think about future exposure potential. And um, of course, there's cleanup being proposed. The cleanup goals, the ESLs, um, they're very conservative. They're very protective. They're more strict than what's used through most of California. Um, and uh, remediation is planned to remove the source material, as we've heard about, and to block vapor transit so that any new vapor might go into the neighborhood. Um, in my view, the most important factor for future exposure is putting new buildings on that site because there are some areas of the site that have high soil vapor, PCE, that aren't going to be remediated. And if in the future new buildings go on those areas, they should have a site-specific risk assessment to um, make sure that vapors are not going into those buildings. And that's it. Thank you. Oh.
exposure to uh, to <coughs> PCs that you can get through cleaning stuff. Right. So you could essentially we get exposed by getting our shirts done and all that kind of thing. Yes. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot less use of PCE in California now. California is very progressive. And they have uh, they're well on the way of banning the use of PCE and dry cleaning, but it still does. <coughs> it's not done yet. But I think that ends in 2023. Um, but but that is absolutely true. There's volatilization mm -hmm. off of dry cleaning clothes. And commercial if products. Commercial products. <coughs> the PCE and commercial products is not being banned, so we will continue to have exposure to that. Really. Okay. So you'll be sticking around. Okay, great. Yeah, I was wondering, is there any possibility of testing any of the animals in the area? Moles or rats or anything to see if there's any exposure to them, and since you that's what you study is rats and things. You know, that's I mean, an interesting wouldn't question. it hit the animals first? I mean, they're rolling around in the dirt, they're right. drinking water, they're breathing the air all day long. Or are there any animals there? Um, we wouldn't expect exposure to animals like that because these chemicals don't pass through the skin very well, so dermal exposure, rolling in the dirt. If they ate a lot of contaminated dirt, that'd be a problem. And breathing outdoor air wouldn't be so much of a problem. But um, that is an important question in all of these kinds of situations. And that is treated separately as an ecological risk assessment. And it's usually not on rats. And well, it's usually on wildlife. So, um, Birds. Yeah. Uh, yes. Are there any carcinogenic effects of PCEs? Teratogenic? Yeah, are these all carcinogenic effects? Yeah, no, there's no, there haven't been any teratogenic effects of PCE, um, you know, discovered <clears throat> to this point. And we focus on cancer effects because we protect them at lower levels. So by the time we get to non-cancer effects, <laughs> we're already very concerned about cancer effects. So, <clears throat> but there is, um, there is a problem with TCE, one of the breakdown products of PCE, where it can cause malformations of the heart in developing embryos, and um, we're, we take that very seriously, And um, but we don't have TCE levels at the site. Have any of the previous employees of the dry cleaner or the hair cutting salon, or anybody that worked in that center while this is going on, have they been tested for any residue? People who work there. Yeah, I do not know. And um, honestly, that doesn't usually happen in these situations. And it's not easy to detect. Um, not at these levels. Okay, <coughs> that's good. Thank you. We have one final question. Mm. Neither speaker has mentioned the Marinwood Market and its proximity to PCE. Is there? Any statement that can be made that would <clears throat> quiet us, those of us who are in there two, three times a week, not yes. to mention products and the people who work there? That's a very good question. I myself was very curious about this and talked to the water board about it, and um, they were able to provide me with some past data from many years ago where they did test the indoor air in, um, in the market and it was um, non-detect. And they tested, I believe, outdoor air around the market. We wouldn't really expect much in outdoor air. But I'll tell you one thing about, um, yeah, that <coughs> when we talk about, even, even if you went in the liquor store several times a week, you don't have anywhere near the same kind of exposure that a worker would. So right. it is much of a focus on the workers. Okay, thank you. Okay.